meeting. Okay, it's 8.15. This meeting is officially called to order. I'd like to welcome everyone. We're, we're pleased that to have a, people attend our, our Parks Committee <laughs> meeting. And, uh, I know there's probably some ultra, other uh, options, that you're, reasons that you're here, so, but uh, we're glad to have you anyway. Uh, our invocation this morning will be given by Linda Abels, but before she does that, I'd like for everyone to stand and let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Remain standing, if you will. <coughs> Let us pray. Our Lord God, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. Whatever our reason, we're all here to try and do something wonderful for our city. And we ask for your guidance, your wisdom to flow through us that we might do what is best for this precious town that we all love. Give safe travel to those going home on slippery roads and be with us just to help us do our best. Amen. 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 Thank you. Now's the time we have our visitors and citizens forum. Is there anyone uh, that would like to speak to, the, to this committee? No? Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? I just have one correction. We need to. Ms. Bradshaw was listed twice in attendance okay. this year. Did such a great job. <laughs> um, we need to add Mr. Thurlow to and the, the minutes. Yeah, okay. That was all I had for correction. Okay, that's one correction. Anything else? She's bigger than mine. <laughs> Can I have a motion to approve as corrected? So moved. Second. I am. Second. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. All those in favor, rose. please say aye. 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 Was there a comment? I nope. was saying it was Rose that seconded, not me. Oh, okay. It was Rose. All right. Uh, Ashley, you're going to take care of the presentations? Yes, sir. Good morning, Parks Board members and everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, every year around December, this meeting, we do our, um, back up a little bit, I'm sorry there. We do our <laughs> annual presentations for those that really contributed to our department, whether it's through sponsorships, volunteers, helping coordinate events, um, whatever it is, we'd like to recognize them and give them our thanks. Um, so, uh, first up, we have, I'd like to call, um, and by the way, it's kind of awkward, I don't know if I can take this off, but um, you guys do not have to stay for the entire meeting. We're going to do the recognitions first, I'm going to take a picture with you guys, and then we'll take a group photo, and then y'all are free to leave, do not stay for the rest of the meeting, so don't feel obligated. Um, I'd like to call up Mama Cita's, we have a representative from Mama Cita's here. Okay, we do not, but I would like to recognize them because they fully sponsor our July 4th fireworks show every year. It's about $12,000. Um, they did that for 10 years, and we'd really like to you know, recognize them and give them thanks because it's a beautiful show, and we couldn't do it without their funding. So let's give them a round of applause. like to recognize um, a couple of uh, businesses that helped contribute to our park system um, throughout our Get Outdoors Day. We have Basement Breweries and Pite and Plow. Um, they, if you recall, they were involved with our organization and our event and they held the first um, beer craft run that morning and all of their proceeds went to purchase trees for Louise Hayes Park. We actually received 11 of them. So I'd like to call them up here if we have representation from Basement Brewers and Pite and Plow. Now, if I could get Martin out here, please. 
Those of you that do not know Martin, he is our Oz behind the wall. He uh, <laughs> is our multimedia coordinator and he's fantastically um, very talented. He's the one that creates all of our marketing materials, so all of our flyers that you see go out, all of our little commercials, our activity guide that we do. He does all of that design work um, and he does a fantastic job managing the workload because most of it comes from our department. So. I just wanted to recognize him because he does such a great job for us and we truly wouldn't be able to have the participation in our events if it wasn't for his amazing design and marketing. So Martin. new Parks and Recreation Specialist, Rosa Ledesma, to come to the podium for her award. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a few. So first off, um, we want to recognize Buzzy's Barbecue. They have been doing our daddy-daughter dance for 10 plus years. Um, they're going to come back this year. And they also help out with um, our smaller events. They've been at Family Fright Night. National Get Outdoors Day, so we appreciate him and all the hard work that you do. for the Kalu Foundation. They have been a sponsor for Movies in the Park for a few years now. Um, we appreciate their partnership and uh, Movies in the Park is one of our more <laughs> popular events and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as successful as, successful as it is without y'all. <laughs> Another sponsor that we want to recognize that sponsors our movies in the park, and that's going to be Bosworth. Um, they have sponsored movies in the park since the beginning, I've been told, which was back in 2008. Um, so again, we appreciate their support, and uh, it wouldn't be able to be as awesome as it is without y'all's help. Next few guys have sponsored the same event. Um, it is a, it's our summer concerts in the park. It was a new event this year. Um, we got four sponsors, and this event relied heavily on their support, and it ended up being a great turnout. We did two free concerts, and uh, a lot of people enjoyed it, and we're bringing it back this year. So first off, um, James Avery. This next uh, business, I'd also like to thank them for helping out with our, not only the summer concerts in the park, but our holiday lighted parade. Um, for the past few years, they've allowed us to use their vehicles to drive our council members in, and we greatly appreciate it. So, Krenwell Gee. Um, 
Next off, I have um, Dogology. So Dogology has yeah, Dogology has sponsored our Wet and Wag for the past couple of years. They um, provide goodie bags for the dogs to take home, and I love them. I'm sure the dogs love them, and we appreciate all that you do for that event. HEB, um, they help out with our Family Fright Night event. They've been helping out for the past four years, I believe, probably more than that. But um, they are crucial to making the event as successful as it is. We buy a lot of candy for that event, <laughs> and we get it all from HEB. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, also helping out with that Family Fright Night event is Garden Tool Company. I don't believe she's here today. Nope. But they help out. They also provide support, and we appreciate their help. All right. Next, I have um, Peak Fitness. They sponsored this year our guard team. Um, this is the first time we ever got sponsors for our guard team, and uh, they helped us out, and the guard team, I hope, made them proud by bringing home first and second place at the state championship competition, so thank you. Also helping us with our guard team um, was the Kerrville Professional Firefighter Association. They uh, helped us out, and again, we appreciate it, and we hope we made them proud. have a skate competition and that is put on, sponsored by um, co-sponsored by T and J engraving Tito and his guys they come out they bring awards for the kids they have live music they have furry food they do a good job with that event we're happy to work with them on that one Next, I have one for Hill Country Bicycle Works. So they help out with our Kerrville Try, our Kids Try every year for the past 20 23 years. years. Um, Lisa does a really good, and ha she gets volunteers, they do set up, they do tear down. It's a great event. We appreciate their help with that. It's really a growing <laughs> event that is great for the community. So thank yeah. you. She's our office manager at, uh, for our department. Um, she offices at Kerrville Shriner Park, and she's really kind of the, the heart of our department, takes in all the reservations, keeps us in line, and keeps us organized. So, Tina, could you please come to the podium? <laughs> I have a presentation for the Kerrville Shriner Park Butterfly Garden. Um, and just to give you a little history, uh, this garden was installed in 2000. Um, by the friends of the Kerrville Shriner State Park, uh, Ernest Tremaine was responsible for the vision, design, and installation of the garden, as well as the irrigation system. In 2006, the garden was certified as a Monarch Way station by the Monarch Watch Program. And in 2007, a group of volunteers began to collect data at the garden for the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program. 
So since this time, volunteers have expanded to two groups of the Hill Country Master Naturalist, one being the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program Group, and <coughs> the other, around six members of the Hill Country Master Naturalist. Um, we are so grateful for this group. Um, it, if you haven't had a chance to go out and visit the Butterfly Garden, please do. It is gorgeous, it's beautiful, and right around a certain time, mean spring, you, the butterflies are just, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And this group works so hard, and I know you, got, you guys are spread out, I think, are all over here. <laughs> yeah, and they just do an absolute tremendous job of keeping up, and they expanded their work hours to be year-round. It was just you know, in the springtime when they could, it's all volunteer, so when they could have a chance to do what they needed to do, they would uh, do it between those times and have expanded that time. So they're putting a lot of hours in there, and um, we are so grateful for them. This uh, garden is being uh, visited and appreciated by people nationwide. We have people from all over the country that come to visit this butterfly garden, so we are very proud that they're there. <laughs> Justin LaQuay to come to the podium. He is our Parks Operations and Facilities Superintendent. He's over all of our parks, the buildings, custodial, river trail. Uh, Kerbal Shriner Park now is under his purview, so I'd like to ask him to come make his presentations. Justin? Hello, at Kerbal Shriner Park, we have a park host program. Each camp host works around the park performing various jobs, working a total of 24 hours each week. In return, they stay in the park for free. These park hosts clean six restrooms daily. They, they help clean up many cabins, getting them ready to, uh, to rent back out for the next day. Uh, they, they clean out ashes uh, from the fire rings, uh, clean up trash in different sites, and occasionally help mow. Uh, also, their past skill sets help, help get other things done around the park throughout the year. This helps a lot while city staff is tackling other projects in the park. This is a tremendous service to the park. The camp hosts are an integral part of the success of Kerrville Shriner Park. They are the eyes and ears around the park in the evenings when the city employees are not there. Uh, I'd like to recognize all five of our Kerrville Shriner Park camp hosts. Uh, Jack Renoff, Joe Collenbach, Jay Birdsong, Eric Strop and David Bieber. our presentations. I'd like to again thank everybody for their contributions to our department. Thanks so much. We really couldn't do it without all of you. And again, let's have one more big round of applause. And thank you everybody up for watching. Thank you to everybody at the front. We'll take one group picture and then we'll let you guys leave. If you'd like to go.
We might need to do a couple of rows, maybe, and squeeze in as much as we can. Try to get in everybody in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I have to get all excited. Well, I'm messing that. Like, oh, let's just space it this way, maybe. Let's see if we can get to it. <laughs> you do a lot of work. I don't have the agenda. <coughs> uh, the next item on for discussion is the uh, parkland dedication ordinance and Malcolm you gonna give that? Yes sir. Okay. Let me jump to uh, let me jump to uh, update uh, from last time. We're, as I mentioned uh, at our last meeting we're going to be bringing this back to you uh, in bits and pieces over the next few meetings uh last month's overview kind of gave a snapshot of what our existing ordinance is what i wanted to do today was go over where we are now in our internal discussions at staff level we've had some conversations not only with city management but also with the uh, city attorney and anytime we're looking at uh, changes to the uh, code of ordinances we need to heavily engage the city attorney so let me give you an update on that the uh Parks and Recreation Board, we're going to have take the lead on this, and again, we've already started on that. Uh, we'll be looking at options uh, starting uh, with your next meeting. Uh, the uh, questions I think that we're going to need to weigh are going to be how much of a change do we want to make to the current ordinance? Obviously, there's some updates that need to be made. Uh, but one of the things that we've discussed with the uh, city attorney is really more of an amendment to the existing ordinance as opposed to a total rewrite. A total rewrite is going to take a substantial uh, effort. It may not 
probably doesn't need to be needed and lastly uh, it would involve outside counsel city attorney doesn't have the uh, time or necessarily some of the background on updates at state law level so what we're going to be looking at is primarily an amendment uh, we do need to question whether or not we want any uh, uh, changes that are going to require some major uh, emphasis in the uh, ordinance uh, right now if you recall we're uh, basically a fee in lieu of land uh, ordinance not necessarily a bad thing with Kerrville's current situation the uh, reviews will be uh, handled by the code review committee uh, and also the planning commission before it goes to city council for final review uh, in action and it will take us uh, a good part of this next uh, year's meetings to kind of go through the changes that we want to make the uh, questions I think that uh, we need to look at or based upon what's the existing ordinance right now obviously we've got this fee in lieu of emphasis uh, and the justification for that is still as it was in the early 90s is still the same and that is the uh, we have adequate parkland in Kerrville for a town this size it's uh, uh, substantially uh, well served by parks uh, pretty evenly spaced and a variety of different types of parks with the addition of the river trail and sports complex that's even added more variety the uh, funds that we currently require in the ordinance were probably minimal in 1991 and they have because of inflation gotten way beyond or way behind in regard to uh, kind of where we stand with uh, current real estate costs and then comparison to other cities I'm gonna go through a little chart on that uh, those low fees uh, also are not indexed in the ordinance and I'll talk a little bit here in a minute about how some other cities have been able to keep up with inflation rather than just amending an ordinance all the time uh, the other thing that needs to be looked at looked at is we have a breakdown on residential uh, categories based on size of dwelling unit uh, as opposed to what other cities look at uh, and that's more of a uh, single family versus multifamily the other is ETJ uh, pays a lesser amount ETJ is the area just outside the city limit but with it with it's in the one mile purview of the city of Kerrville uh, the good thing about the ordinance is it does have some updates in state law and one of them is that there is a geographic uh, boundary system where there's districts which is required by law uh, and highway 16 is the dividing line we think that's geographically a good break point let me kind of walk through some comparative ordinances and these were I kind of picked these because they're substantially different uh, but either uh, or any of these other cities are in what I would call development corridors they're in places where development is uh, fast and furious Kerrville I wouldn't say we're in a fast and furious development mode here but let me walk through uh, Kerrville's biggest change or biggest uh, area of question is the fees uh, per unit uh, and just kind of keep in mind that it ranges from $125 per uh, residence up to $225 per residence based on the size of the unit and there's a breakdown of those it ranges from less than a thousand feet per unit up to over two thousand in the ETJ it's a little bit less than that <clears throat> the good thing about the ordinance is it's simple to manage it's not very long uh, and uh, it has uh, some good points that we feel like need to be salvaged and that's why we're emphasizing the rewrite rather than the total uh, or the amendment rather than the total rewrite uh, but it is a bit outdated if you look at shirts uh, as a comparison a uh, little bit bigger city it's in the it's in the general region but it's also a basically a, a suburb of San Antonio and so development is something they've had to live with there uh, they have an interesting preference toward not just fees in lieu of but also encouraging private parks uh, they have gated communities in shirts and so private parks make some sense it's pretty hard to build private parks if you don't have a gated community in fact it's impossible you couldn't enforce it 
Uh, so they not only encourage private parks, but also private development, which is something that I think we can look at here where the developer actually puts in the park up front as opposed to giving the money to the city for the city to do something later. Uh, and that is a good option for, uh, I think, Kerrville. Uh, they do an annual review as part of their budget process on their uh, fee in lieu of per unit, which I think is also another good thing we need to look at. Uh, and they do not accept any land, even though they have a land emphasis, they won't take anything that's less than five acres. So they've actually gotten out of the neighborhood park business, basically. In San Antonio, I, I was involved in this one, and I would not recommend Kerrville even venture anywhere near anything like what San Antonio has. It's a s complicated, uh, development-driven, uh, multi-agency, multi-committee, sausage-making operation. And it is uh, driven by a lot of support from staff. It requires a real estate market value or proof of real estate value by the developer uh, on how much land cost in that particular area because there's such a divergent uh, real estate cost in San Antonio. Uh, we had to come up with something that covered 500 square miles, uh, which is the ETJ in uh, San Antonio, and that creates this uh, very complicated system. Uh, I would not uh, kind of put this one in here because all park dedication ordinances are not the same. They're all individual <coughs> to your particular committee. College Station is also in a growth area. Uh, they uh, emphasize both fees and improvements. They encourage both. They have a much higher per unit uh, fee in lieu of number. Uh, there too is complicated primarily because they engaged A&M to help write it. Uh, and that just has added a level of academics to it that makes it fairly complicated and they do have higher fees. Uh, the statewide trend, if you look at the average of most, uh, most cities kind of have a balance between asking for land and asking for fees and giving the local government the out, the, the right to, to uh, veto uh, either one. Uh, so it puts the burden back on uh, like a master plan. Uh, there is a, a fee variance in the state that's pretty dramatic. Uh, you know, Jersey, not, uh, it's not Jersey Village, but one of the larger uh, suburbs in the state charges well over $2,200 per unit. So you can see it gets pretty pricey when you get into some areas of the of the state and we just need to keep in mind that Kerrville can only drive so much. And then lastly, uh, every ordinance is different. Each city has a little bit of a unique uh, model for them. So I wanted to kind of plant that in your mind. There's not a cookie cutter approach to this and we think that the Kerrville ordinance is, uh, is one that we can work with in regard to just an amendment. Uh, the targets that we need to look at, uh, obviously there are some state law changes pretty much every few years in regard to real estate, subdivision ordinances, uh, park dedication ordinances. We need to keep all those in mind as we go through this. <clears throat> Kerrville's done a pretty good job uh, addressing those back in the first uh, developments of its park dedication ordinance. The city master plan has some comments and then obviously the city's park and recreation plan uh, have some involvement with the park dedication ordinance as does the city code through the subdivision ordinance. The uh, fees and categories for fees I think are gonna be our biggest challenge. That's the area I think we need to clean up the most and then we need to look at ETJ and how we treat the ETJ because that's the area where the city is growing. It's outside the city limit, but it's within the development area. And if you look at Kerrville, the population inside the city is 25, 24,000, but just outside the city, it's metropolitan area is about 40,000. And that's because there's so many subdivisions uh, that have gone in uh, just immediately outside the city, but there, many of them are in the ETJ. And that's a critical issue because the city will expand 
uh, into uh, the ETJ over the years. So with that, uh, I uh, here to answer any questions that you might have. Next time, we'll bring forward some uh, options on these, primarily these last four items to look at changes that we think make some sense. But before we do that, I want to get any feedback that you guys might have that might be uh, pertinent to whatever we bring forward. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Yes, ma'am? Um, when you have something for us to discuss next time, if we could get it a few or several days ahead okay. of time. Okay, we can do that. We can come prepare. Sure, we've sure. I know you don't now. meet as often now, so that's a, good, that's a good point. We'll make sure we get that out to you. Malcolm, yes, sir. Uh, the McDonald uh, proposed uh, development. Yes, sir. Uh, since we, I guess we've already brought that into the city. That's no longer ETJ. Is that right? I, I don't know if it's in the city limit, but when it develops, I'm pretty sure it, it will, will be, be annexed. Yes, sir. Now they're putting in park land. Yes, sir. Are they? Are they in addition to that paying the fee? Or I have not seen their. What the, if they even have gotten that far yet, but my guess is they may do some development. And if they do some development, the city may want to look at that. So as, part of the development agreement then is probably can, we can waive the fee if they put in river trail. I would think land. that's more than fair. That's, that's how that's done though. I mean, it's not a, it's not a for sure you're going to pay a fee. That's for, right. Okay. That's right. If there can be an amendment because of logic, then I think that's what we need to do. And it may be the, the template for kind of where we are with our future amendments to this ordinance. But the current ordinance allows the city to, when, you, when they agree, enter a development agreement, to waive the fee if they put in... You, like, yeah, in, any ordinance. That's a, that's a uh, any any ordinance can be waived or a variance can be provided by the council. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And is that comprehensive 2050 plan? Is that kind of part of this discussion too? You know, well, we had some discussion with the consultant about how to word that, and when they went through the process with the public on developing the the, the plan, uh, the terminology, and I have that in here somewhere. Uh, this was last month's uh, if you look at the two uh, comments in italics those are the pullouts from the 2050 city master plan and that's really all it says about park dedication one is to uh, evaluate park dedication because we need to update it this process here and second, we really need to look at existing neighborhoods uh, in infill areas and how we want to address those. So those are really the only two comments in the 2050 plan that deal with park dedication. But we did want them to add something mm -hmm. in that document so there would be a trigger for this. Okay. One other question, Malcolm. That I thought the code review committee had like a six-month timeline on it. I'm not on that committee, but I... Uh, but for their items for their, it, them to do their review and report back. And there's going to be some give and take and working with various departments uh the re the, the amendment to this uh is a lot less cumbersome and so what involvement they take versus if it was a total redo or a start from scratch that time frame is obviously a lot longer this one may not involve that and we haven't answered that yet one more thing are you saying uh, like on the fees and stuff are, are you saying that you're going to try to write it such that they are not set in stone is that, is that it's an option to do that uh, you've got you know there's three or so basic ways to deal with fees in lieu of the Kerrville method has been put in a fee structure uh, that is now 27 years old mm -hmm. that unless you amend that ordinance, you're stuck with that. And just imagine what things cost in 1991 right. and then compare that today. So how many cents on the dollar we're getting now compared to then is you know a math problem. The second thing to do is you build into your ordinance a mandatory review 
of real estate. It could be every five years. It could be something that is done associated with that ordinance and an amendment to that ordinance. But the ordinance triggers, a, it forces you to evaluate real estate cost. The thing you have to do with fee in lieu of, you need to base it upon two things. What it costs to develop a park, which is what you're in looing, right. and what is it cost for real estate <coughs> because the set aside for parkland is real. So those two things, it's a balancing act for that. The third way to do it, and what some cities are doing, is in their ordinance they're saying include your fee in lieu of in your budget process. So it doesn't even define how much is in there. It just says every year you will, and then every year in the budget process there's an evaluation of the fee in lieu of amount, and a lot of cities are doing that. The, the fourth one is what San Antonio does, and that forces a, a real estate evaluation, and I think that's way, way, way beyond what we need to be trying to do. There's just not enough development here. Can't you just use KCAD assessments, so it's not as you know, I, as it sounds? The, the you know? thing about uh, real estate evaluation, uh, at least in San Antonio, what we used was Mr. Developer, bring in your Tax. your contract. Show us what you bought the land for. And if it was within the last two or three years, then we'll go with that. If we know what park development costs uh, generally, because it only it costs so much for playground and you know those kinds of things. So I think we could get to a number. Uh, KCAD is is an option. Uh, you know, if, if there's a feeling that is pretty updated, that's okay. The problem with that is that is a residential value. We're not looking for residential value. We're looking at residential impact <clears throat> to parkland. So it's, it's two different things. If you can glean out of your uh, KCAD data just the real estate and feel that it's fair, that, that is an option. Typically, are these one-time fees, hmm. or are they paid one -time over fees. time? One-time fees. No, one-time fees okay. up front. Mm -hmm. They they pay based on the flat. Uh, on the yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and it's not when the unit act is actually built; it's paid up front for the. For the you can do it two plan. ways. You can do it when it's platted, or you can do it when a building permit is brought in. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that has to do with how big the development is. Kerrville has a lot of smaller development. You know, this is never an ordinance that is an impact to like a single family, one homeowner building a lot, building out a lot. That's not right. what this is about. So it can be done either way. There's a lot of property that's platted, but was platted 25 years ago. I'm and curious just about uh, <clears throat> Comanche Trace. We, they just uh, uh, announced an expansion out there. Are they doing it in fee in lieu of? Comanche Trace was brought into the city with a development agreement and I think because of all the private parks that they do out there, uh, they're probably uh, exempt from any future uh, associated with this ordinance. I think their entire property was included in that development agreement. Yes, ma'am. Um, sort of a devil's advocate question maybe, but um, if the development provides its own park mm -hmm. um, and then the park isn't kept up or will there be any hooks in the ordinance to require a certain level of maintenance and quality be kept in the park there's a couple ways to protect against that one no shoddy construction you know that needs to be you, you don't go to Sears and buy a swing set you know you need to put in good quality no, no slight on Sears backyard equipment but that's mm -hmm. not what you would put in a park uh, so you want to make sure that there is quality improvement. Uh, there's really no way for there to be a viable inspection process by the city. Uh, but if something goes awry at the subdivision, you know, the HOA can't keep it up or whatever, then there may be a reversionary clause that that goes to the city. That's, that's pretty common. Can and then, some of these funds be actually used for maintenance of existing no parks? No maintenance, but you can renovate. It, it all has to be associated with construction. There can't be any administration, legal fees, uh, human resource fees, maintenance, general maintenance costs, or anything like that. It all has to be toward actual real estate or development. 
And could that be written into the amend amendments that uh, a portion of that would be put into reserve for maintenance for that park? No, it's against the law. Oh. That's why we have to make sure when we look at this, there's, you know, there's a handful of state laws that we have to follow that um, are the bulletproofing of any ordinance like this. There have been several lawsuits on this ordinance, most of them back in the 70s and 80s, uh, that kind of created the world we're in today. And you cannot use any of this money, even interest earned from... All your fee in lieu of money goes into a fund, mm -hmm. a dedicated fund, and interest earned on that can't even be used for maintenance. Yeah. If you have to renovate, then would the city charge the HOA for the cost of that? Well, I mean, Are you talking about the one you brought up before? Uh, <coughs> well, if the HOA bellied up, then there's nothing to, I mean, build people all day long, but they aren't in existence, then it's... But, I mean, if the park is just not maintained, as I said, this is perhaps the devil's advocate question, but just looking ahead, if they do the park in lieu of paying fees and then the, the park isn't maintained, does the hot potato come back to the city to field it? And if so, who bears the cost? You know, there's, uh, you know, how difficult and complicated and uh, comprehensive do you want to write this, you know, if, if know. all options are yeah. th tried to be thought through, well, you just forgot 20 of them. I mean, you know, you can't think of everything that might go wrong. I think the, the key, though, is if you decide to credit private parks, private development, you're right. There needs to be some catch-all that has some kind of safety net toward the taxpayer, whatever that might be. Uh, a big one, not necessarily part of park dedication, but a big one has been over the years, small subdivisions that have these little neighborhood pools and, and cities all over the country, those have bellied up. And those always, I guarantee you, the one thing that cities do is they go in there with a wrecking ball, crack a hole in that swimming pool and fill it up and put a playground there. Uh, so there are some remedies, but they're gonna have to probably give up their real estate to do it. Malcolm, so. is there a time limit from the time this park is to the new park is to be built? You, there designed? is a there is generally a uh, let's say there's subdivision A and subdivision B. Mm -hmm. Subdivision A comes in this year and they give five thousand dollars and it goes into a fund. Subdivision B comes down the pike two years from now and they give five thousand dollars. The way it works is all money is traced and it's first in, first out. So if there's $5,000 for this park set up, there needs to be some resolution to that subdivision's money. The thing is you have a 10 year limit. You cannot keep money hoarded for longer okay. than 10 yeah, years. That's what I was when, now, when do you can do that start? in a lot of bookkeeping ways but the idea is you're supposed to collect the money and then do something with it. Okay. How much do we have in the fund today? 150? About 150. 150,000. And so how much do we collect on average per year? Man, I've, Kerrville's it, development is not a consistent, it's a roller coaster. So it goes in spurts. Yeah, it, you know, you may have two or three years and you don't have anything. Yeah, and then, okay. you know, some years you'll have a, you'll have a McDonald type project. You'll have something that will yeah. just blow the thing up. So, you know, I'd hate to say there's, there's a, an average, yeah. uh, but over 10 years, we could do the math on that. I would think we're probably bringing in five to $10,000 a year. I'm just okay. guessing, so it's you not, know, it's, we're not, we're not, we're not getting rich off this thing. At least uh, under the current fee. We talked about this a little bit last time, but can we use some of that money? Are we close enough to some of these developments to build the playground that we want to build at the sports complex? You could. The, the thing that you have to remember is uh, Sydney Baker divides the city into two districts, east and west. The money that's kept in the park dedication account is itemized east or west. So if the subdivision is developed east of 
I or uh, Highway 16, the money has to be spent east of Highway 16. So it only be eligible for something that is going to be within that district. So it have to be in the western district, and there would have to be enough money to do it. Do we know the breakdown of the 150,000 between east and west? It, I, I don't have that, but okay. yeah, that's available. Okay. Yes, sir. So in our current ordinance, do we have something about private parks and how that is addressed? No. So I'm looking at my notes from 2011 when we discussed right. this, and it says we don't have anything for private parks right. written into the ordinance. Right. So we still don't. Nothing has 2011 Nothing. up until today. This is the last time we've talked about this was 2011. We I dropped it. We dropped it in 2011 for two reasons. Okay. So Comp plan. That's right. That's right. Which drug out forever, and park master plan. That's we decided we don't have to wait on the park master plan since the comp plan is. But done. we never, but it got it never. Never got was dressed. amended or rewritten. No matter. In any of these, okay. No. So we're back to the what to do about private right. parks. Right. 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 So what's what's our schedule? <coughs> well, when's your next meeting? March. Gosh, March. I can sleep three or four times between now and then, so <laughs> I will get you something before the next meeting for you to peruse and have questions. And then we'll do it again at the March meeting and try to dig down into this so we have actually have something concrete to talk about. We Can have we? had emergency meetings along the way. If you feel like we need to meet before that. Yeah, or if y'all wanted to set up a subcommittee, I, it didn't matter to me how you want to do it. But, but you know, March, we need to be putting this thing pretty close. Would you to like it. to have some, some help from some people on a, in a subcommittee? If, that's up to you if you want to kind of uh, – have a process now because of quarterly meeting you may want to have a, two or three people that we can sit down with and kind of walk through this. I think That's be a, it would be a good thing to have some people that's that strictly up to you guys can, can I ask a question of the members I mean what, what's our thinking on private parks what why do we want to have this ordinance address private parks well, no, because of the go ahead well, if a developer comes in, right? If he comes in and he says he's putting in a private park in his Subdivision. subdivisions, and that will be in lieu of giving money to the park dedication, but it also means that that park isn't open to the public, right? right? And so it's, you know, is that is that okay? <clears throat> in other words, because it's only servicing his development, and we are talking about parks for the city you know does it well does are it we count? are we talking about parks for the new residents that are coming that's exactly the, the discussion and I, and I, 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 right there's from two. my per perspective we're talking about parks for the, the people that are coming into the to the new subdivision right and if if through negotiations with the city they say you know you're doing a pretty good job of putting more parks in than and for the number of people you are, square footage, <clears throat> I'm not sure why There's we would have a problem with that. A couple of things on private. One is the private park is different than private development. You know, if the subdivider wants to build out the park to help sell lots faster, but it's going to be an open to the public park, that's one private consideration. The other is a private park that's accessible only through like a gated community that's the only way I see that working in Corpus Christi what we did is we gave them a credit if you did a private park in your subdivision we gave you a 50% credit toward fee and lieu over land and that way it wasn't a total whitewash but it was <clears throat> giving them credit for something they want to do inside a gated community I you know we don't have I can't think of I mean, gated communities are in Kerrville too I mean, yeah. there's hardly any. So that doesn't mean that there won't be a, a, a wave of them. Uh, this amendment can be amended too, or this ordinance can be amended too any time. So if there is a change in development trends, then it would be good for this ordinance to be amended. We shouldn't wait 27 years to amend it. I, so. I think the Parks Board should be available to review a private parks plan to see exactly like you said if they're putting a pool in and we think that within years it's going to fail 
we should be able to bring that to their attention. And here's the only want to do something. Else. Here's the only drawback to that, and I don't know what your subcommittee, if you create that, might do. But waiting three months for a developer to have the mm -hmm. parks board weigh in on whether or not a park that, that's probably not realistic. Yeah. So there needs to be some consideration for timing. I don't know what that is. I'm not saying that the review shouldn't happen. Okay, it could be a mail out, respond by email type thing. Uh, which is perfectly fine, uh, but waiting for this body to meet at this time, I think, would be a little bit too onerous for a developer. I, I think, together than a from my perspective, we're an advisory board. I, I, no. I think we leave, aren't we? I, no, I agree with you. We're an advisory board. I think we leave it up to the development department, the parks department head, and city manager to to make decisions that they take to council. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't think any of us will hesitate to pick up the phone and call Bill Blackburn or Judy or whomever and say I don't like what you're doing with McDonald Corporation on that issue if it gets to that but quite honestly I don't unless they change our role I don't uh, I think we ought to do anything but look at the at the the at the uh, ordinance and say yeah we think that's good ordinance or not I don't want us to get into Individual development. Code development, yeah. yeah. We're, that's my, my problem. we're I, not doing, we don't in any way supervise what uh, private subdivisions and developments right. are doing now. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking of River Hill. They've got a big pool, uh, tennis courts, mm -hmm. and all of this. There's nothing to be said when they decided to build more cabanas and, and improve it. That didn't go by any city thing, did it? That's well, when it was property. originally uh, platted, there was no park dedication ordinance. So it, it seems like <laughs> a totally private park for subdivision to offset a responsibility to the city is missing something, though, because it's not really the city. It, but it, but remember, the law, the state law says. The recipient, the beneficiary of that subdivision's park, whether or not it's fee in lieu of money or uh, an actual park, needs to be first and foremost the residents of that subdivision. So that can be a mile away, but it can also be within a gated community. The debate is nobody else can get there. And well, when nobody the else can get there, then there's a value to that. And, and some cities have given a credit to private development, but not 100%. It's a, right. yeah, a credit for providing a park, but it's not available to all right. the people in well, the city. Let me, let me end with this. Be thinking about it, but this is exactly the yeah. spirit I was looking for. <laughs> Y'all are getting into it now. Uh, so you can tell when you get through with this, it's a little more in depth than what yeah. you see when you mm -hmm. first look at yeah. it. So, uh, there's a lot of thought that needs to get into it, and we'll give you something to chew on prior to your next meeting. And I don't know if y'all want to set up a committee or not. That's up to you. So, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, just a really quick question. What What is your timeline for this? I mean, when do you want to try to wrap this thing up? Here's the, here's the only thing that is uh, time consideration here. One is... Every day that goes by, you don't have it. It's not updated. Uh, the other thing is you don't want to be tackling these things during a depression. An economic depression is not the time to be tackling any change in something that's economically driven. So the quicker we strike on that, you know, I think everybody knows we can't keep this engine running like it's been humming. So. Uh, whether or not that's something, anything more than an economic correction or if there's actually a downturn, who knows? You know, we'd all be wealthy if we knew that. So the question becomes, you know, daylight's burning. Let's get this thing over with. <clears throat> I see this being at least two. You're going to get at least halfway through, I think, this next year because you only meet every three months. Well, that's what I'm wondering is if in the next three months, you know, that we meet January, February, March, March. to try to... You know, instead of forming a subcommittee, I mean, I think all of us want input on it. And why don't we just 
have a special meeting? We can, we? I mean, we've called special meetings through the year well, what, already. Why don't we, we do this? Well, why, why don't we do this? Well, let me take a shot at kind of what <laughs> I hear and what I think and what Kerrville may be comfortable with. Send that out, and then y'all can decide if you want to have a meeting on it. And maybe we can do that by the end of January. Yeah. Is that Give okay? Malcolm enough time to That's a good do plan. His, yeah, let's do that. You don't need to meet if you don't need to meet. So. Right. I mean, maybe we do one more between now and March, you know, that we go, February. like, the beginning of February yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay, get back to us when you can, and we'll... And we'll make a meeting around okay. that. Okay, we'll work yeah. around that, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank I personally you. would like to see the board talk it out versus making a subcommittee, personally. Sure. Yeah, it is a talk out thing. Yeah. <laughs> Having gone through these for years and years. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, if we have yeah. a subcommittee, we're still going to all talk it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, I know. And so why not just have a meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we had a meeting for it, we could have like a table where we could yeah, actually. The other thing you need, and I don't want to keep talking about this, but one of the things that we need to uh, think about is who needs to review this? You know, there's obviously internal committees and review by the city, but, you know, at some point are we uh, needing to talk to some developers? This thing keeps, I don't know where this thing's going. Oh, was that me? <laughs> okay. Don't turn it upside down. Uh, the uh, development community here is pretty small, but it doesn't hurt to get two or three of them in a room and say, hey, here's what we're looking at about, you know, give us some ideas, here's especially if they've got some pending developments on the drawing table. Yeah. You know, those might be realistic. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Michael. Ashley, you, are, are you going to do the project's start. update or is Ashley? I'll get started and then okay. she can. Uh, let me give you a couple of updates on uh, some projects. Uh, the HEB Tennis Center, uh, we've had uh, plans uh, bid and, uh, man, I swear I'm not touching this thing. Uh, you have a couple of slides on tennis. Huh? You have a couple of slides on tennis. The uh, uh, project is bid. Uh, it came in higher than the uh, uh, budget, but there's really not anything else to uh, uh, change in regard to uh, the scope of the project. Uh, it's just the, the way things are. We got very com we didn't get many bids, but they're very competitive. And when you get competitive bids, that means that there's not a big difference between the high bid and the low bid. Uh, we were pretty comfortable that the uh, project is right online. We couldn't find anything really to cut. We went back to the uh, EIC last month and asked them, hey, do you, if you want to do this project with the bids we have, we need another $250,000. They set up to $250,000. So we're going to move forward now uh, in uh, uh, the month of December, hopefully, we're getting kind of late, if not early January, we'll start our pre-construction meetings on the uh, Tennis Center project and get that scheduled uh, to begin uh, probably around the first part of February. So that's kind of the update on the, the Tennis Center. Does anybody the council have any? approved the, the additional 250? Uh, so they were supposed to do that last mm -hmm. night. Let me ask yeah. Ashley. Okay. They did. Yeah. Uh, so that is something that is uh, moving forward, and the EIC was excited about it. So that's a that's a good project, and we are very comfortable with the local contractor. J.K. <coughs> Bernard is a, a building contractor here, very reliable, and they have a great attitude already about the project. So we're really comfortable with that. Now, is, that have any? is that everything, including the covered? No, 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 the covering is a 2.5 million plus project. Yeah. We're doing everything though, to get it ready for that. We're moving, uh, those, that bank of courts out so that that cover could be added if there was some private fundraising or additional, uh, EIC money or something like that in the future. But the, the covering is something that is, uh, a separate project. Anybody else have any questions on that one? You said it's starting in February? We should have no problem getting started by the first part of February. 
Oh, let me go back and that project, everything but the cover. <laughs> <on that. laughs> so you're going to be involved uh, in this process? Yes, sir. Construction process? Yes, sir. Okay, let me go to the second project the EIC is funded. And, uh, man. <laughs> uh, well, wait a second. I got other slides. Where are they? Is it possible to get this sent to is us? Is that it? You only put one slide in? To the trail? No, there should have been four. Okay, well, anyway, we'll talk to this one. Uh, the uh, expansion of the river trail uh, is done now with the uh, extension that most of y'all went to uh, at the Dietert Center with the first uh, funding that we received in 2010 and 11 of $6 million. This next phase is a uh, $1.5 million uh, extension up to the uh, Shriner University and then the neighborhoods beyond Shriner. Uh, the goal here uh, associated with the EIC is Shriner is a economic engine here in Kerrville. Uh, they have an issue with losing students after the second year uh, and anything that can be done on campus or in the community to help keep kids or attract kids uh, is going to be a benefit. So the trail extension, not only to the university, uh, but also to the north bank of the San Antonio River in that area uh, is a key. And then lastly, and probably just as important as anything, connection to the neighborhoods that are past Shriner. That'll get a connection for pedestrians coming from those neighborhoods that can get on the trail. So it's a, about a one point, a little over a mile uh, project. That's uh, G Street where it crosses over the river? It, mm -hmm. the, the old G Street bridge, uh, there at G Street Trailhead, there's the old pedestrian bridge, that, or the old road bridge. That's going to be a pedestrian bridge, and that'll get us over to what's now the River Trail Cottages. Cottages. <laughs> uh, and then there's some development that's occurring there, a little synergy happening in that area of town. Uh, that's going to then kick the trail due east on the north bank. Uh, we've only got four pro private properties we have to deal with, uh, which is a good thing, because the last one we had like 15. Uh, so four properties, and we think they're gonna be uh, amenable to this, because it's gonna, they're, they're seeing what the trail is now. Uh, and then once we get past those four properties, we have Shriner University land. Uh, they, they own the bulk of that. So we'll be able to go underneath the uh, bridge there on uh, Highway 16, there at the cemetery. The university owns the perimeter of the cemetery, and we're gonna follow that edge, which butts up to Quinlan Creek, and then we'll cross uh, at a fairly shallow area of Quinlan Creek over to their outdoor pavilions, that old pavilion that's right there, and that's where the trailhead will be, and then we will create a walkway that goes back up into the subdivisions there on Park Street, Travis Street, that area. So we're pretty excited about that extension, but it's a million and a half uh, uh, project, uh, which would be pretty tight. Uh, the council has asked that Shriner contribute to other improvements. So they're gonna be doing some perimeter trails around their campus, uh, and then that'll be open to the public. They'll also allow all public to access the trailhead and the trail on their campus, which is pretty unusual for a private university to say, public, come on to our property. But they're, you know, they've never really discouraged that, so they're going to encourage it now. Uh, and then lastly, the uh, construction of a restroom at the pavilion at some point by the university uh, that can be part <coughs> of the trailhead is something that, uh, that has been asked that they do. So. Uh, we're, we're pretty pleased with this next phase. There'll be other phases, obviously, it will be added, but this is one that the EIC could fund right now. Am I to understand, you said under Highway 16, you meant under Highway 27? I'm sorry. Yes. We're, we're gonna go I'm sorry. Under, <laughs> I'm sorry. We're yes. going to go under yes. 27? 27, yes, sir. There's a, you'd be surprised how tall that bridge yeah, yes. is. Yeah. It's really tall. Right there uh, in Quinlan Creek? So we'll have, we have plenty of headroom there, so uh -huh. that'll be... 
Uh, okay. Yeah, it's 27. I'm sorry. Can we get a copy of this? Yes, I know. Okay. Yeah, there's a. We've got some I other slides that have more detail okay. with it. But that, I mean, that's kind of hard to say. I was in the whole Great. So, so anyway, that's that. So has Anybody? the has he uh, agreed to to fund this at this he, point? Yes, yeah. sir. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't gone to council. It hasn't gone to council yet. Council is going to look at it next. They didn't look at it yesterday, they so didn't. I think it's next the next meeting, which would be in January. Uh, and th at that time, we'll also award an engineering contract. We're looking to do the formalization of the funding agreement by the council and the EIC, and then also award the uh, the engineering contract to get started on it. We don't, you know, the economy uh, because of inflation for concrete and steel has just continued to rise and we just need to move as quickly as we can. Does on that, that have so. to do with the tariffs? No, no, if this happened well, <laughs> this trend happened well before that. So uh, the key for us with the trail is obviously it's 95% concrete and uh -huh. steel. So we just need to move on with this. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in January for a public hearing and the funding agreement and then subsequently it will go to council for final approval so procedures. Okay. Thank okay. You. I wanted to give you all an update on our aquatic feasibility study. I know some of you have been attending the public input meetings but for those of you, uh, sorry there's something wrong with this clicker. It goes back and forth. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it appears to be sticking or something but um, as a reminder Martin needs some help. Okay, so as a reminder, you know, the facility is out of date. It was built in 1970. It's not ADA accessible. We have holes in the pool, plaster. We have mechanical deficiencies, all that stuff that we've already talked about a few times. So our aquatics um, consultants, Marmon Mock, has been out to the facility several times doing their study. We've held um, several public input meetings. We've held one in City Hall um, back in... Sorry, this is getting annoying. She's not looking pretty good, Ash. <laughs> <laughs> Back in October. There we go. <laughs> See if we can get our, uh, might be a battery problem. <laughs> you all get a sneak peek okay. at the presentation. That's not fair. Uh, well, how about this? <laughs> Come on, you can get on its own. You may have to just tell me how to do it. I'm going to go back and just, just tell me how to advance over the slide. Okay, we're going to stop here. Yeah, just turn it off. Sorry about that. Did we give him an award while ago? We did. We were reading All right, so uh, go back to the public input meeting slide. Next. No, next, next. This one, okay. So we met with uh, our stakeholders to gain their, their input. We held our first input meeting October 11th. We um, then subsequently sent out an online survey, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. We held our se second public input meeting in November, and then we'll have a subsequent survey coming out uh, based on that. Next. Okay, so here's a snapshot of our first input meeting. It was a full house. There was not a empty seat in the room. Um, here's a couple of photos next of, um, yeah, of course, we have Diane in there, uh, mm -hmm. in Bedford, um, doing their uh, dot exercises to show um, the type of amenities that they would like to see. Okay. Um, you can hold it there. Okay, so for the priorities from the public input meeting one, you can see that recreational swimming, lap swimming, water aerobics, water safety, uh, swim lessons was the priority on activities. And the features, if you look in the top right, um, open water swim, lap lanes, competitive lanes, water exercise area were the favored um, features. Um, and then below, we have a little couple of support for water volleyball um, and then a lot of support for the observational room. Switch. Okay, so here are the concepts that we presented at the first town hall meeting. There was four, I'm, I'm sorry, five. Go back. Uh, the first one is essentially um, no major improvements, just bringing the facility up to code and addressing any maintenance issues. The second option would be to add a bulkhead into the pool to be able to allow for competitive swim and do a little bit of improvements to the building, bring it up to code. The third option, as you start to see a little bit more green dots on the board, um, was for bringing, you know, doing one and two, and then also adding maybe a slide, 
um, and doing some more improvements to the building. And then number four and number five is where it, it kind of, uh, you see the major improvements. Number four was the natatorium and the recreational facility. Um, and then number five, the only difference between those two is number four has a natatorium, which is an indoor pool, and number five has an outdoor competitive pool. So the only difference, again, in those two is indoor versus outdoor. Next. Next. <laughs> and the price. Okay, so we, um, like I said, we solicited an online survey. It was not a scientific survey. I think I explained that in my email. Um, it was an ad option that we decided not to do. It was about $20,000 to do in a survey. We decided to save those resources and put out a survey so anybody could respond. Um, you could only re respond once per device. Um, so here's kind of a snapshot of the results. So the, pr the preferred aquatic center um, activity was rec swimming, lap swimming, swim lessons, water aerobics, and paddle boarding. The features on the survey, pretty strong request for lazy river, water slides, wave pool, concession area, open water swim. Um, we asked a couple of questions about their demographics. Do you have children? How many are in your household? Um, we had 83% uh, respond that they were city residents. Regarding the option favorites, um, favorite option ranked was number five, which was the outdoor recreation, uh, outdoor competitive pool and then a recreation, and number four followed that. The least favorite option was number one on their favorites. And then the least favorite options, uh, number one again is the least favorite, number five ranked second here, um, and then option two, four, and three. We asked a couple of questions about funding. What would you um, what would you spend? What would be the highest amount you would spend for a child or an adult or an annual pass? How would you prefer to fund this? And the majority came back to say, we would like to see majority taxes and some user fees as far as the funding source. And then the second ranked highest popular answer, which was really close, a couple of, uh, couple of points, um, is it was the opposite, majority user fees and then taxes. Um, and then we asked the question, how would you vote in a bond election if this was to go to a bond? 72% voted in favor, 12% um, said might vote in favor, 12 not sure, and then four said they would vote against. You know, <clears throat> this reminds me, Ashley, I can see possibly the same scenario that we had with the library in terms of the city paying for it and then the county using it without really being a taxpayer for it, so to speak. And it's something to keep in mind with the pool. If we have a bond election in the city, <clears throat> we're paying for it. And the non-city residents may have a different uh, fee structure in order to keep it equitable. That's right. That's something that we are considering too and possibly looking at would be resident and non-resident fees for, for entrance to the pool. Next. Okay, so again this is a kind of a summary of the preferences versus town hall meeting versus a survey. Uh, recreational swimming and lap swimming, learn to swim are up there. Uh, water aerobics, water safety. Um, and then on the survey, you kind of saw some of the other um, opportunities as well, so, such as scuba diving training, paddle boarding, um, and then competition swims on there as well. Next. The features. Um, Town Hall was concentrating a little bit more on the competitive swim lanes, re uh, recreational lap lanes, water exercise area, open swim, observational room, and water slide. The survey was strong for a lazy, more the recreational side of it. They want the fun stuff, the lazy river, the wave pool, mm -hmm. the food, the water slides, open water swim, and water volleyball. Uh, water volleyball is very easy to do as long as you have the water depth for it. Next. Just another um, snapshot of the slides or the concepts. Next. Okay, so here's how the favorite improvement options laid out first in the actual survey. Um, you can see option five was, was the strongest. Next. Okay, so based on the surveys and based on the town hall public input, we dropped the first two options as they were not favored. So we are looking at um, further schematics for option three, four, and five and the cost associated with those. Next. I want to go back to uh, like that option number four. Um, did you get did you get where there was the discussion about not necessarily having to have two story building over that nat natatorium? Like that was the conversation um, that you don't have to necessarily have huge amounts of seating there. If yeah, look at we talked as two options because there was some discussion about prices. about seating and, and the stories. I, there, the consultants are using kind of the lay of the land a little bit too, and to the best use of the, the acreage um, and the square footage. 
the seating, you know, if we want to be strong on competitive swim for the school district and the university, we're going to need seating. Mm -hmm. If we want to do something that's more year-round, you know, youth program, you know, you usually see the parents carting their chairs and stuff to outdoor pools for that for summer leagues. But if we want to do um, something for scholastic wise, we'll, we'll we'll need the seating to be able to so track. need the second school. To be able to track from the meet. So even number five, even though they call that a competition pool, it's it would not necessarily have the seating. So there, you'd be looking at maybe <coughs> possibly bleachers or bring your own. Right. So I mean, it's sort of like if you wanted to have, you have. You have two different ideas on competition then. On That's that. right. And yeah. so it just seems like on number four, you if you want to have something covered and have it be equivalent to what's number five, mm -hmm. that you would have a, that second option that wouldn't have as much seating. Um, you know, if number five is winning out because it has the cost, is that is so much better than having a two-story building <coughs> with lots of seating, that there needs to be some kind of potential for coverage even if it doesn't have all the seating you know what I'm saying to make those some equivalent yep. closer to an yeah. equivalency okay Martin okay. you could switch anyway. in. next next mm, next okay so overall there's broad support for recreation swim and competition swim um, we've heard support for higher fees and we heard support for bond approval um, and then focus on the most desired concept and features, which we are doing with options three through five. Switch. Some quotes, I'm not gonna read all these to you, but um, we did receive um, a lot of quotes in the online survey. We had an option to where you could, you know, obviously answer our questions, and then is it working now? Thank you. And then um, provide comments. We heard a lot of, hey, we need stuff for the, for the kids. We wanna see you open year round. Please do this. Um, I don't live here, but I have kids that want to do a swim team. Please do this. We need more fun things for family. Um, we heard um, some from senior adult population that say, please do option four or five. Only doing, you know, the minimum option one is a waste. A beach entry would be most beneficial for our seniors. Uh, we like water aerobics. Quality of life is very important. Um, the hours need to be extended. By the time you get off work, there's not enough time to use the facility. We know that. We know that we close at six. We have programming that starts at 6.30, so to be able to accommodate everything we do with our budget and our staffing, we have the hours that we have that's based upon that. Um, and, you know, I get it too. I'm a working mother, so I can't take my kids to the pool after I get off work because, you know, we have programming going on. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, competitive organizations can people that are saying, please, we want to bring competitive swim to the Hill Country. Um, you know, it provides youth, adults, and seniors master level swimming opportunities. Um, they want an amateur Taft Swimming League, which, which I'm very familiar with. Um, of course, here's all the negative ones that we received, just four, surprisingly. Um, city has enough debt already. Don't raise our taxes, no more taxes, and then you wasted more money on the survey, and 80000 um, was ridiculous. We didn't spend any money on the online survey, just the, just the actual study of the feasibility study. So again, concept three, what that does, it has the building improvements, addressing maintenance and code compliance, the bulkhead for the competitive swim, and it adds a couple of recreational features, a slide, maybe a lazy river if we can afford it, um, and then a little bit of improvements to the children's area. So this would be the least expensive option that we're looking at. Concept uh, four. Go back one second. Uh, uh, was there a bulkhead uh, between? Yeah, yes, there, there's I a see, bulkhead okay. in there. Yeah. You can see okay. that rectangular line. Option four, again, this is, this is the big one, uh, likely the most expensive option. It has the expanded recreational areas. It has um, lap lane, open swim, open swim, has an open beach area for children and anybody can just walk in. You have sides, you have a high and a low dive, you have a shallow water shelf, you have a lazy river, you have canopies, you have major building, actually um, new building improvements. And then you also have the natatorium there as well and improved parking. So if you look to the left where that parking is, that's um, ball field two, at, um, right below the pool. We would be taking some of that field out to be utilized for parking, to add parking, because we would not have sufficient parking if we were to do these enhancements. Okay, so what it includes, again, just kind of like I've already said, um, it includes an auditorium and the, ex the expanded recreational features. This is, this is the big improvement. Um, concept five, uh, again, no natatorium, it's an outdoor year-round pool. So um, there's things to be considered such as seating, 
such as the weather. You know, you can't host a swim meet if it's raining, if it's you can't see the bottom of the pool, lightning, thunder. Um, you know, the elements play a big factor as well. The quality of life for the staff, having lifeguards out there and, you know, 40, 50 degree weather, having kids. Um, you know, parents are less likely to put their kids in a, in a fall or winter swim lessons program if they're going to be outside. If it's inside where they're comfortable, they're more likely to do it. So um, there's pros and cons for, bo for both concepts that you have to, that, we are, that we're keeping in mind. But again, ultimately, it's going to come down to what the community wants and then if we're able to afford it. So just to highlight again on the big features that we were, were, were hearing from the community, they want slides, they want water volleyball, they want lap swims, they want a lazy river, zero entry, play structures, and water features. They're, they're looking for competitive and they want fun stuff. They no longer want the hole in the ground with, with, uh, with water in it. Any questions over the... When are, when are, we, when are we going to get the, the So we're meeting estimates. with our consultants next week. We're going to get the preliminary cost estimates and look at those and evaluate it and then we're going to put together the survey and ask put another survey out and say hey here's your concepts now here's the correlating corresponding costs associated with that tell us your thoughts now um, so we'll take that input back and then kind of run from there but we will put that out to the community so everybody's involved and of course the parks board okay any questions Okay, hey, uh, director's report, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna try to fly through these since we're running a little bit late on time. Um, y'all know we had the October flood event. I just wanna show y'all some pictures, if y'all haven't seen these, of how high the water got in our parks. Looks like the thing's acting up again. Um, this is Louise Hayes Park. You can see our, um, our, our splash pads underwater, our stage is underwater. Um, cool. We got some high water in the parks. I was actually down there taking all these Amazing. pictures. Running people out. There were people that were mm -hmm. jumping the fence, jumping the <laughs> gates. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? But Lupe was dry. Lupe survived. <laughs> but you can see this, the, yeah. our fountain that's covered in water. Our umbrella survived. Um, ducks are still Yeah. Um, and uh, it, typically, if uh, we knew the water wasn't going to going to get as high as the umbrellas. But if we were anticipating that, those, those can be pulled. Um, but we knew they would be... They would be fine. Um, <coughs> ducks walking. The ducks, the ducks enjoyed it. They're <laughs> swimming around the <laughs> the river as well. Here's an aerial snapshot of snapshot of Kerville Shriner Park oh, in the no. bridge. Um, you can see where the boat ramp area is, the trailhead, and the footbridge. All of that was underwater. I thought that was kind of a neat picture to see. And you can see how high on the boat ramp that water um, the water uh, level came up. Here's the amphitheater received some water, and then. This is the top of the boat ramp area, so when you were actually driving down the hill, dang it, I'm so sorry, y'all. This is very annoying. I'm sure for y'all, too. <laughs> I'm like, what? But this is the top of the boat ramp area, and you can see the water, the water line, the debris line. And um, that's how high the water got there. It was completely underwater. And you can switch it, Martin, to the next slide. Um, no damage at Kerbal Schreiner Park. It did take down um, a little bit of fencing that was near the boat ramp area, but that was something we were able to address and get back up. But um, no, no damage, just kind of a little bit of debris cleanup. You can switch slides. Um, again, another um, nice view from the boat ramp area, completely underwater. Switch. Okay, um, back. <laughs> All right, this is at um, Guadalupe Park, right? Yeah, um, you can see the water treatment facility across the street. Um, the water came up. It's a little bit above the sidewalk and area down there. Switch. You can see debris floating down the river. Mm -hmm. um, this is our Lowry River Trailhead. You can see back. You can see the trails underwater there where the text is. Um, of course, we barricade off the trails when things like this happen. And then the, the picture on the right is a section of the old trail. And then left is the new section of trail going to the Dieter Center that was underwater. Next. A picture of Cypress Park, just kind of in that park, just to show you how high it got to the boat ramps. Um, clean up. Next. Uh, we had the big cypress tree that hit the G Street Bridge, did a little bit of damage. Um, so we actually contracted out to get a crane to um, remove that. That was, some, that was a job that was essentially too, too much for us to handle in-house. We didn't have equipment that would... Where'd that come from? Do you have any idea? Par the, the tree? Yeah. We don't. We don't know where that came from. We tried to find it, but there was actually a few cypress trees that we saw floating down the river. Um, and we're not sure where this one came from. Next, just a couple more sh different angles of that tree. You can kind of see the size of it. It was huge. 
was. Um, and we still had the trouble keeping people off the trail, even though it was underwater and there was a tree there. <laughs> There's still people very dedicated. I'm glad they love the trail, but I wish they'd be a little bit more safe. Um, Waterline in Louise Hayes Park, you can see how it got up to the, to the Lehman and Monroe area. Next. Um, a couple more shots of Louise Hayes Park. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of damage. It just mainly just, um, yeah, our landscaping took the biggest brunt of it. Um, so we have staff cleaning up um, landscaping. We had, uh, you saw the tables knocked over. There's um, next. Uh, the river trail is underwater. Um, <coughs> we had a tree on Tranquility Island. A um, little wow. bit of damage here or there. You see the, the met mitt stations knocked over the trash cans are knocked over I next it moved that did you lose any uh benches no nope it moved one but we found it in the back um so some little bit of this kind of stuff you see with the with the debris hitting the the um, pedestals next uh, the, <coughs> i'm just about to talk about that we'll go back to that slide martin Okay, so uh, we had a lot of debris catch on here. You see these wooden rails, we lost several of them. Um, these are something that's been in place for a very long time and it's time to do something different. So we are taking those wooden railings out and putting up cable. We have ordered the material, so it'll be up in about in a couple of weeks. Um, ultimately, I would like to do something kind of like the Town Creek Bridge from um, how the trail goes from Riverside Nature Center to Lowry to where it's built up a little bit. Um, it's um, it kind of prevents you from getting in the water but the, the problem with these rails is they're very heavy and it's time consuming to lower them so i don't feel comfortable having staff out there in inclement weather where it's rain it's lightning it's thundering and having asking staff to go out there and move heavy things where it's slippery there's lightning um, and and putting their safety at risk so we're going to do something a little bit different but it's going to take a couple of weeks to accomplish uh, just a question do we even need the rails yes because of the height of the bridge we do um, it's not an accessible, ADA accessible area, so, well, the, but, the, the stairs up the library are not ADA. That's right, yeah, that's so saying. not by, I don't know if Malcolm has any comments too, but. It's, it's not an ADA issue as much as it is a code. Safety. Safety. Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of logical, we get a lot of, there's a sign on the other bridge that's lower that says don't diving on the bridge. You got to tell people what. <laughs> well, and just people that are in the park I mean having taken little grandchildren there that bridge goes up to a playground and they know they can play around on the river trail and then they can run up those steps and play in the playground and is it that you've got little bitty kids that can if there's no railing at all they'll fall in that water we'll pick well, we them up and send them we don't have one at the town of Creek crossing that's that's what I discussed that I would like to, to move to but that's going to take a little bit more money You're right. You're and right. it doesn't go to a playground. Yeah. Okay. Next. Um, so here is Kerbal Shriner Park. Um, talked about where the tree came down and just a bunch of, uh, not the tree, I'm sorry, the fence right there. Fencing came down. We had to um, get that back up and then uh, kind of a lot of the cleanup you can see here. Next. Next. So uh, this is something that staff is working on, not my department, so please do not ask me specific questions. Uh, back it up, Martin, thank you. Um, so the Amazing. distribution lines were impacted with this weather event. Um, these were potable and effluent lines. It was not sewer lines. Um, I know some people have, have kind of put those rumors out there. It was not sewer, it's potable, um, reuse, and then one of the lines was vacant. Um, this is something that the engineering staff and administration is working on to resolve um, with the city council. Um, and again, uh, not my forte, so if you have any specific questions, just shoot me an email and I'll try to get some answers for you. Next. Okay, so the Limo Street footbridge, these railings are a little bit different. Um, they also have the ability to um, be lowered in the event of the flood, which our staff does. They go out there and they lower them. A little bit, little bit simpler than the wooden ones, but they're still pretty heavy. Um, but it does the job. We didn't have any damage to those. Um, next. Like I said, minimal damage, trash receptacles, trees down, signs pulled, that kind of thing. <coughs> Next, um, water line levels is uh, G Street area on the KSP side of the trail. Next. Okay, so this is a new segment of the trail going from Lowry to Dietert. Um, we had a bunch of uh, debris and rock 
that was moved and put up on the trail and there's Justin there posing for us. Um, so uh, that was something that we were able to work with our contractor to, um, and, and staff to clean up and get ready <coughs> for the opening of the trail so it would stay on time. Go. So that's the biggest problem with that new section is that it's right down in the middle of, of it's so low. Mm -hmm. And so this was, okay, so stop here. So this was the biggest issue as far as the, uh, I'm not even gonna say damage to the trail, go back. Um, there was a little bit of erosion on the outside of the trail. You can see the trail is intact. We have uh, 30 inch toe downs on the trail. It was designed and engineered for this exact purpose and it held up beautifully. Um, and I will say that this, you know, this was during kind of the construction timeline, so I'm not sure if it would have performed um, better if we were farther down the line, but this is, this is basically the worst that happened to the trail. So we went back in there and filled it in um, and rectified that, but we didn't want to leave it there to have a, have a drop off issue and safety issue. Next. Okay, so some of the wildlife we found on the trail, found lots of turtles, fish, <laughs> crawfish. You saw this huge catfish. <laughs> it was actually still alive. It was on Tranquility Island. Staff grabbed it. I took a quick picture, and then we released it into the water and swam <laughs> off. I think kudos to uh, Malcolm and whoever designed the trail. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. And to the, your staff, staff. Uh, Ashley, for cleaning it up. I, Quickly. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it survived that flood, and my gosh, within a few days, we were able to walk. Yeah, Most thank you. Anyway. Did our best. Outstanding. Yeah, it was yeah, outstanding. Thank you. We have a great team. Next. Okay, I'm um, talk about the sports complex activities next. <coughs> next. Okay, so we have several organizations that use the soccer fields. Um, I'm not going to go over this chart, but you'll see basically um, from November of, uh, supposed to be 2017, I'm sorry, not 2011, um, <laughs> from November of last year up until currently December, we have groups out there that are using the fields. We have um, ASO, Hill Country Soccer Association, we have Hill Country Crush, we have OLH that uses it, we have Notre Dame, um, and then actually staff attract, attracted a, um, a tournament in the first of December that had about 50 girls teams that came, and they were from all over Texas that played at the soccer, soccer fields. Next. Next. Okay, so DBAT has held, to date, 729 tournaments, so that's roughly 30 tournaments or so. Um, according to their agreement with us, if they are in the 400 tournament team range, they do not pay rent. Um, of course, their rent is free for the first two years, and then after that, <coughs> they pay rent based on performance. So if they perform anywhere near like they did this past year, um, they will be performing very well and would not owe the city rent. They do pay us for concessions for a little bit during their tournaments, um, but, uh, but they are, it is making a, um, a big difference in Kerrville, and they're performing very well. Next. Here's a snapshot of the hot tax revenue that I wanted to show you guys. Um, go back, Martin, hold this slide. Um, it shows where the sports complex started hosting tournaments. Um, green is FY18, red is FY17, and blue is FY16. Um, so you can see that the sports complex is having an impact on hotel motel tax. Yeah. People are coming here for the tournaments, they're staying in our hotels, and our revenue is increasing. Um, so just wanted to help you guys understand that and, and help us get out there in the community if people are asking about this. It's not a direct revenue source for the city, it's an indirect economic impact to the community. Next. Yeah, how much is the hot tax? Is that one percent? Oh, what is it? Seven, seven? Malcolm, do you remember? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I, I don't recall. I think it's quarter. Quarter percent? I think. No, it's more than that. I think yeah. it's uh, six and seven percent, is that right? Six and seven. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get that back to you. Um, and DBAT already has their 2019 tournament schedule out. You can see they're scheduled out essentially every uh, weekend so far through the summer. So they have a lot on their plate and they're recruiting tournaments again. So that's just another good news story for Kerrville is they're out there, they're working hard, and they're attracting these tournaments. Next. Okay, so 2018 uh, fiscal year, sports complex had over 2,000 soccer. Next. I'm sorry. Keep this slide, Martin. Keep it. Go back to the fun fact. There you go. 2,000 soccer kids, um, 20 baseball, softball tournaments, 291 field rentals, and used over 42 million gallons of irrigation water, which I'll talk about in a minute. Next. 
Um, I'm going to kind of skip through these slides a little bit because you guys have seen this, but I will show you pictures of the progress next, next, next. Okay, so soccer lighting's complete. Um, you guys knew this already. These are, these are some of the projects that y'all identified and, um, and ranked. Next. Pay of maintenance road is complete. You see the before mm -hmm. and after shots there. It's been very helpful for our staff and our mm -hmm. crews keeping everything clean and uh, being able to drive on the paved road. Next. Here's another shot of that maintenance road. Nice. And that was done in-house by our streets department. Um, irrig Next. Irrigation um, and the common areas. Um, you can see the trenching from the irrigation lines. They're currently in progress. We've done pods one um, and, and most of two, and our contractor's working to get the rest of those installed. So they're working on that, um, and then we'll go back in and do the appropriate um, landscaping according to um, the plan. Next. Okay, so our fertigation system with our reuse pond, you guys know this. Um, I like uh, this picture I wanted to show you because it kind of shows the activity on the soccer side as well, but there's our pond. It's 1.5 million gallons. We've been using this since the summer. We have uh, watered with 42 million uh, gallons of irrigation water, not from the pond last year, but for potable water. Um, and again, um, effluent uses, um, we're using the reuse water versus using drinking water. So we're saving um, not only our drinking water, but also um, dollars too. It's significantly cheaper to use reuse. Next. And you said it holds 1.5 million? Mm-hmm. And you use 42 million, so it, how does it get refilled? It get, we have lines to refill it. Oh. Um, from the from the river? Is that no, no, it's an effluent water. water. From the, it's effluent water. Oh, <coughs> from the so, so if you remember driving down Holdsworth, they had all that construction. Mm -hmm. Those were the reuse lines going into oh, the pond. Okay. It's, it's coming from the big, the big reservoir. pond. Yeah. yeah. From the reuse reservoir. Okay. 90 million gallon dollar pond. I thought that million. was the reuse reservoir out there, so it's a different place. Okay, so turfing the dugouts, this is scheduled. This will happen in a couple of months, so we're still working on it. Um, we're just waiting on our, on our vendor to come out and do it. Next. Okay, so our sidewalk extensions are complete. You can see the before and after picture, and this has made a huge difference with not only staff, but um, the, the attendees that come to the sports complex who no longer kind of have to either cattle trail it through where you can see that people were doing and staff. Um, and walking along the building, but they have a kind of an easier access point to go to the concession stand. Next. Uh, additional extensions, you can see a before and after picture here. Mm. It kind of extends off the building into the sidewalk. Yeah, better. Next. Adding the sidewalk extensions to this gate. So it's much easier for us to get equipment through mm -hmm. and folks coming through when you have big tournaments, you can open up both sides of the gates and people can come in. Next. You can see the fresh pad here that we poured um, in connection to the, and the new sidewalk going down to pod two in the concession area. Okay, something I wanted to show you guys a picture of is, um, so this was our tournament that we held a couple of weeks ago. We know we have a parking issue on soccer. We knew we were gonna have a parking issue on soccer, um, but there wasn't a whole lot that we could do about it because of the way the land is and the way it was designed. Um, so this is something that we know exists. Um, and we're looking at ways to see if we can kind of help mitigate this. There's a little bit of extra parking that we can put in over there. Um, of course, adding, you know, asphalt and paving, it's expensive, it's not cheap. Um, so this is something that we're addressing, we've already identified in our project list, and it's something that I just kind of wanted to show you guys a snapshot of what it actually looks like. People were double parking in the grass, people were parking in the fire lane, people were parking along Town Creek. Um, so, next. Okay, special events and updates. I'm gonna fly through these real quick next. Okay, we had Family Fright Night next um, on Halloween night. Um, <laughs> it was a free event. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, HEB. We had a great turnout next. Um, thank you to our Park Board members that helped us at the event. We could not have done it without their help and thank you for being festive. We appreciate that. Everybody had a great time next. We had trick-or-treating, we had games, we had all sorts of fun stuff for them. The only thing we couldn't do was the bouncy house because it was raining. Um, so even though it rained, we were a little worried about our attendance at first. We had a huge turnout, the biggest go back that we've ever had, and we even oh, had a nice. rainbow. And I wanted to take a picture of that because I thought that was nice. It was fun. That was great you arranged that. Yeah, that was good. We were all soaked. Uh, next. Of course, we had the ribbon cutting for our river trail. I know several of y'all were there as well, and I appreciate y'all's support. Um, and if you go back. So these t-shirts. Those things went like hotcakes. We got rid of all of them the morning of the dedication. All of them were gone. 
So we reordered more and we're actually able to use our hot allocation that we get um, back from the CVB each year. So it didn't cost our department anything to get these made. Um, so uh, it was something that's kind of nice for us to get out in the community and people love them. We're still getting requests for them. <coughs> Next. Holiday Lighted Parade was held a couple of weeks ago. We had a fantastic turnout of downtown. The streets of Water Street and Earl Garrett were lined with people. Um, and it was a really awesome event. And I'll show you a couple pictures here. Next. Good weather. Thank you to everybody that helped. There's Rose driving our Grand Marshal, Phyllis <laughs> Ricks, um, and a couple of folks. Um, of course, we had Tyvee there. Um, we were not able to get the Tyvee band. They told us no. We were not able to get any band in town. We were told no, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So that's something that we're hopeful for next year. So if y'all have any connections or can help us with that, we would really appreciate it. Cause I think that adds a lot of yeah, ambiance to the parades. That would be good. Next. <clears throat> so I saw on our application that we received one for belly dancers, and I was a little concerned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but they assured us it would be appropriate. So the above picture is actually that group, and I, they actually won their division. Like they won, and they yeah. were they did a beautiful job. Uh -huh. They were lit. Pretty. They were covered. They just it was more of a dancing, um, and they just they did a really awesome job. So mm -hmm. it was a really good event. Next, uh, we held a couple of uh, sports leagues. We have adult soccer, flag football, and kickball. We had several seasons of those that have done very well, and we're continuing to grow those. Next. Our daddy-daughter dance is coming up in February. Next, our most popular event um, started in 2009 with 200 participants. We moved to the Youth Event Center and are selling 500, 550 this year, and we have sold out every year. Next, next, tickets go on sale January 2nd. <laughs> what a sweet picture. Okay, so the next uh, thing I just kind of want to remind the board is we have terms that are coming up um, at the end of March. The people that have reached their maximum amount of term limits for this time uh, will be Jim Gardner, Diane, and Bedford. Those that are eligible for reappointment are Rose, John, and Lisa. So if you are eligible and you are interested in still serving, continuing to serve, you need to put in an application to Brenda, I'm sorry, not Brenda, uh, Cheryl's office, um, city secretary's office, as soon as you can. Um, and it's scheduled to be appointed at the city council meeting in March the second meeting in March. So if you're interested, get your applications in. Oh, can you get us, send us some of those statistics and the numbers for the, how many tournaments have been played, how many people have come, because yeah. people ask us in the community and uh, Yeah, I will send you this entire presentation. I, I think I need to have a little card and keep it in my purse. So. <laughs> That's good. It's good to get that information yeah, out. A lot of people um, and the last thing we have is uh, next is item 5A, which is the meeting schedule. Um, this is uh, the only one that I adjusted from the second Thursday was March because it fell during spring break. Martin, if you can bring that up, thanks. Um, but here is how the calendar lines out. If y'all would like to vote on that and approve it or make any changes, I will turn it over to you. Okay. The, the three of you that have... Uh, that are eligible to renew, uh, jump in there. You, they have to go through the process just like they, uh, the first time they were appointed, right? That's right. And Miss Tina actually has the applications here if anybody would like one. Mm -hmm. Sure. I move that the quarterly meetings as set for 2019 be accepted. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. all I have happy to answer any questions okay uh, item six uh, items for a future agenda anyone have anything they want to talk about in coming meetings um, I would like for us to as a as a board um, agree to commit to uh, one or two events each person but kind of helps be the coordinator and the uh, liaison with the parks department. So could we put that in there? Uh, if you're asking for people to volunteer to be a big participant, do we need actually a motion for that? Can't we just? Uh, I'm, I'm asking for that to be on the uh, on the agenda. Oh, okay, yeah. We'll so that, that we so agenda. that we have a sign up, and so that maybe by March y'all have you know real specific. Uh, events that y'all would like to have a liaison with the parks board 
the, that we would sign up for that. The problem yeah. I see with that is that when we try to plan that far ahead, life happens. And like, I, I try to come to everything that we can, and you all do too. But by the time I found out when the opening was going to be for the new part of the river trail, we already had plane tickets for Sacramento, California, and we're gone a week. And right. so, I, but like there's major events, like they have several major events that are always on the schedule. So not things that just come up, but the major events. So I acted as the liaison for the family fright night. Right. And so worked with them to try to, you know, put together the process of the, of the, um, what do we do, the costume oh. contest and such that they didn't have to worry about it. So something like that, like or at the, at the outdoor event that there is yeah. a liaison. Well, I'm just saying that yeah, right now I could not say I will be <coughs> that liaison for something in November. Okay, right. so this is well, an, an agenda item for, for March. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Ashley, would you bring a list of all the major events uh, at the next meeting, and we can that would, put our That would be there. helpful for you Absolutely. to have a liaison from we'll the do. Parks Board. Okay. All right, good. Anything else uh, to be brought to this board by anyone? Okay, I hear none. I so if we hear a motion for adjournment. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you. Aye. 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 Aye.